So constructing our emotions from predictions. And I just wanted to remind everybody again, so maybe this is a good time to do that, actually, <laughs> that our nervous system gets very charged up and we have ways to let ourselves settle down. So if we were to do a couple of long exhales, maybe with Vu or just, just longer exhales, so taking a deep in-breath. Exhale, Vu. So try to get your exhalation to six seconds or more if you can. Let's do that two or three times. And as you exhale, let your shoulders relax. Let the tension go out of your body. Notice your hands, your feet, your seat. You could look around the room and notice if there's anything dangerous happening in your environment right now. Most often there isn't. A couple of long exhalations. And settle our shoulders away from our ears if you're clenching your teeth. See if you could relax your jaw. And then this point about neuroception is unconscious. This is our primitive brain predicting that we're not safe from multiple experiences. So if you were to turn around and look behind you and just let your eyes confirm what your conscious mind already knows, that you're safe in the room that you're in. And if you weren't safe in that room, you wouldn't be here. And look to the other side as well. And then come back. And as we're going through the inquiry to remember that we have the agency to back away from this in some way, we could do some tapping on our forehead, take our attention into the sound and sensation of the tapping. We could do some breathing. We could stop altogether and we could get up and walk around or shake. So there's lots of options that we have. So this is the book we were looking at last week, How Emotions Are Made from Lisa Feldman Barrett, and how we construct, she calls an instance of emotion. So it's a, an emotion that comes through each moment, and it's this interplay of our past experience. So it uses everything that's ever happened, all of this stuff that comes in, and it predicts what's going to happen next. And this is like neuroception, our perception of threat. It happens outside of our conscious awareness. So our brain, the way it works is it groups things into categories according to goals. So if we have a goal of transportation, we create a category of things that could help us get from one place to the next. If we had a category of housing, we might look at a car, for instance, as a place that could house us if we didn't have anywhere else to stay. So our brain is quite sophisticated, but it always remembers all of the things that came in and we have this ability to try and make sense of, of what happens. So our brain says, what are my concepts? Is this like? And they call it statistical learning, which I think is another just kind of a way to say our brain is based on experiences. So it sets us towards a particular kind of mind. And so if we have a lot of experiences, like in that image of one girl is being made fun of, and the other three are kind of banded together, depending on where you are on that side, you're going to have a different experience in your nervous system. We have the better safe than sorry, our negativity bias. Our primitive brain only wants our physical safety. This is evolution. This is our primitive brain, our nervous system. So it doesn't really care about happiness. All it really cares about is, is our body safe? So when we look at this prediction, we're looking at I trusted someone, they let me down. So now I'm going to be more careful. But then at some point we're like, okay, well, maybe not everybody's bad. So we try it again and they let me down again. And then we kind of confirm that, okay, I was right. I better stay at home. I better, you know, I better do something to mitigate the risk so that I'm not being hurt so much. And so this is the evidence of what we're doing now is the evidence is starting to pile up on a more positive side that in fact it is safe to come into a group for instance and to be honest and authentic and it's safe to get to know ourselves as we as we limit the amount of that inner critic that happens we become safer for ourselves so so then we still might blow it a little bit 
by by turning against ourselves, but then we notice it and we come back to some kind of self-compassion. So this is something else that we were looking at last week as well, that some of the information we need is in the minds of people and it's um, it's words. So as we're looking at words, love and fear, anger, safety, we have all of our experience with those words and with the emotion and with that experience. We have all of that evidence that comes forward as well. And so our emotions are really associated with people and with experiences. And with some people, we feel safe to be who we are. And some people we don't because that's our experience with them. And that because we're working with this momentum of evidence that's built up in our neural pathways through our whole life, it's not an easy thing to turn to turn around. We need a lot of experiences of safety with someone if we have previously felt unsafe with them. So even as we're doing this own work and we're becoming much more attuned to ourselves and to other people, it still takes time for this whole thing to shift. I wanted to pause here and I'm going to just go to the next slide for a minute here too. So this is the inquiry that we're going to do. When I was a child, my experiences of whatever it is led me to predict this. So example is my experiences of being unloved, hurt, and not protected led me to predict that I am not safe with people. And I see and accept my childhood experiences and beliefs and know that they affect my predictions even now as an adult. So this is kind of a learning thing. My childhood still affects me now. And then we're going to just look at the words, the thoughts, and notice the feeling and sensation in your body. So let's go back to this slide of images. So some of the images on here are connected and nurturing. When I look at that baby with her mom in the dress, Obviously, her mom really loves her to make a matching dress for her. And you can tell by the way she's relaxed on her, just kind of leaning into her mom and kind of sleeping there that she feels safe. And you look at some of the other images on here. And some of them really bring up a feeling of safety. And some of them feel really dangerous. So don't force yourself to look at the ones that that trigger something really intense in you. But just to notice there's a variety of experiences. And then maybe close your eyes if you want, or if you're journaling, you could kind of just have your gaze steady. What were your experiences? And what beliefs and predictions did you absorb when you were a child? And as you're looking at that, notice how that feels in your body. And as you look from one of the images, look of that dad and his baby, there's such a close connection there. It's really sweet. Or the mom and her child. There's some here that are really, really sweet. And there's others that are really scary of being yelled at or having to run away, feeling kind of lost and alone. So notice your body and notice what happens in your body as you're looking at these pictures. And then relate it back to yourself. So in that picture of that big family group, sometimes when we have an image like that, we have a feeling of, yeah, they look happy, but I've been in those kind of group pictures and I felt really different or lost or out of step with them. Oh yeah, that was great. I remember that time. It was so much fun to see everybody. So just notice what's coming and going. Let's let's spend a couple minutes here and then I'm going to go to the next slide again. What kinds of experiences come to mind as you look at these images? And regulate with your breath through your body. Notice that your body is in a 
safe location right now. Notice what emotions are here. Notice that you can affect your experience right now. If it feels like there's something that you don't want to have, you know, kind of go into, you could always stand up and move around. You could turn off the sound on your computer for a minute. There's all kinds of ways that we can take agency here. And we might also be feeling quite intense and we're still just kind of looking at it, breathing, allowing ourselves to be present. So take care of yourself. And then to be looking at these inquiry questions. So the first part of this is to notice what my experience has led me to predict. And just pick something. It doesn't have to be that intense, but just pick something. My experiences in my family led me to believe that when everybody got together, they were going to get drunk and make fun of me or whatever it is for you. And just kind of let that land. It might land in images, words. See if you can stay really connected in a kind way with yourself. Notice your breath. Really feel that in your body. How does this feel in your body as you're thinking about this, as memories are coming up or as you're looking at this prediction sequence that happens? And sometimes we might bring our adult self into really connecting with the child that we were at the age that we're working with. We can have so much compassion for how hard it would have been to feel that way when we were that age. And as you're sitting with that and you kind of regulate a little bit, so notice your body again, your seat, your feet. You might do box breathing for a moment if you're feeling kind of activated. And then come back and kind of look at which of these predictions are still true and which of them are less true now. And it might be just as true. My prediction that When I walk into a room, this is going to happen, or my prediction, whatever it is your prediction is, it might be still true. Some of them might not be as true. And many of them are very much affected by our own regulation. We have different boundaries now. Maybe we really remind ourselves of kindness. Maybe we bring a friend. Maybe we've really seen through that belief. We don't any longer believe that it's our fault or that we're unlovable. And that changes everything in the experience for us. And so part of what we're doing here is we're bringing forward more positive experiences. So if whatever you're working with, it was primarily that you were not seen, you were not attended to, you didn't feel safe, we can let our body and our nervous system experience that it's different now. It's not always like that anymore. Maybe we've got different boundaries, or maybe the people that used to hurt us are healing. We're kinder to ourselves. Let that, just focus on that for a little bit. Let that in.
And then coming to just a few minutes of love and compassion. I had many experiences of being hurt and feeling unloved. You could have your hand on your heart if you like. What happened to me as a child was not my fault. And I'm willing to nurture kindness and compassion and connection now. And let yourself really feel that. I know what it feels like to be hurt and feel unloved. And I really know now that that was not my fault. The adults did not create an atmosphere of safety for me. I'm not saying it's their fault either necessarily, but I know it was not my fault. And I'm willing to really nurture the kindness and compassion and connection now, starting with myself. Let yourself feel into that. See what happens. See what comes. And notice if this creates resistance, which it might. Sometimes we might feel like we don't deserve compassion. That's a very common result of disconnection from trauma. I don't deserve compassion because what I did hurt other people. Or I should have been able to figure this out earlier. So those are very common ways that we turn against ourselves. So just keep coming back to the willingness. I'm willing to nurture kindness, compassion, and connection now. Let yourself feel that. Take some deeper breaths. And notice if you need to do something to help regulate your system. You might do box breathing, look around the room, say five things you can see, do the five for three to one practice. You could do some standing and shaking, shake out that energy. You can sit with your hand on your heart for a while longer. What do you need to do that will help to bring you back into regulation? And that's usually some variation on bringing our adult self into the room and letting ourselves be kind, like we would to a child. And then when you're ready, let's take another minute or so just to connect with our hearts and then open your eyes.